thank you all very much for uh, for many of you in your support for our efforts at NRSC. Um, and I appreciate the statistics that you said. Um, and it is uh, interesting to me that my greatest political challenge in my own reelection uh, is the complainers about the kind of Republicans that we elected. And in fact, the attack, because we supported incumbents, we didn't get the, the change uh, in the nature of the Senate that some wanted. Uh, but I'll stand with the thought that we have uh, 12 new Republicans uh, in the United States Senate, nine of which uh, defeated uh, incumbent Democrats. And to believe that, uh, it, as in every election, the opportunities for success really lie with the quality of the candidates. And that's what we tried to emphasize, as I've indicated to you over a period of time. And you mentioned a couple of them, Shelley Moore Capito. Uh, we talked about her, her here uh, previously. Uh, she was a fan, you were a fan of hers and a favorite uh, she is of yours. Um, and she really was one of the first to announce, and you may recall that she was immediately tacked, attacked as not being conservative enough to be the Republican nominee in West Virginia. And uh, we immediately responded not with uh, you know the, the kind of normal rhetoric, but with a, the clear conviction that Shelley Moore Capito is somebody that can win this election. She's demonstrated that time and time again uh, in West Virginia, and she's worthy of uh, support. <coughs> trying to to emphasize what I thought was the uh, most important thing we could do is elect uh, nominates, you know, nominate candidates who are electable. This came home to me very quickly. One of the primary responsibilities of the NRSC chair is to raise money, as many of you know. And uh, you normally go to places in which there are money. One of those places is New York City. Uh, New York City is, I'm reasonably comfortable there, but it's not the normal place for a small town in Kansas to be. And my first experience as chair of the NRSC going to New York was to meet with several dozen um, consistent contributors to the Senate Campaign Committee over a long period of time. And what I immediately discovered is there was very little interest, in fact none, uh, no interest in supporting the NRSC based upon past experiences in which they had contributed significant sums of money with no success. Uh, and most of them had contributed tens of thousands of dollars to Governor Romney in a campaign that did not succeed. Uh, and so the message that I got in January of uh, 2013 was, uh, well, we're glad you're here, but don't expect any help from us. We're tired of contributing and not uh, having electoral success. And what occurred to me, uh, because of my close relationship with the National Association of Broadcasters, is marketing matters. And the only thing that we have to market are our candidates. And if I'm going to succeed in going back to New York to convince these folks that while their initial plan was not to do anything, maybe they should, the place that we might be able to convince them is here. Look at the people who are running, who are our nominees. And uh, one, don't you think they might be electable? And perhaps even more importantly, don't you think they would be great senators? And so that was the, the, the primary uh, interest we had as finding candidates. <clears throat> and, um, in some circles, what that is portrayed as is that you are always, <clears throat> pardon me, interested in finding the most moderate uh, Republican. Uh, in my view, this doesn't have much to do with how you fit on the political spectrum. Uh, it has to do a lot with how you can communicate, whether you can convince uh, the people of your state that you actually understand them, care about them, you'll work hard for them, that you share their values. And so the easy attack, uh, as I indicate, on those of us involved in the NRSC is that we didn't uh, support conservatives. In my view, we're not agnostic to that. We want conservative Republicans elected to the United States Senate, but we want conservative Republicans elected, we want, let me say it this way, we want conservative Republicans elected. And so the, 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 the threshold was if you are only a candidate that can win a Republican primary, but cannot win a general election, then you serve no purpose for the cause which we are about. And just to take a step back, and I've told this to you before, but to remind you that while I was interested in a Republican majority Senate, the primary motivation for me to chair the NRSC, which is somewhat outside my norm of operations, uh, for those of you who've known me a long time, you would categorize me as a, a member of Congress who pays a lot of attention to his home state, uh, his home district, 
uh, works on the nuts and bolts of taking care of Kansans, uh, and to chair the Senate Campaign Committee would not be something that those who've known me a long period of time would think that uh, I would step forward to do. But as you may recall, the conversation in February of 2011, I had clawed my way through a Republican primary, had gotten elected to the United States Senate, came to Washington, D.C., raised my hand, took an oath to the Constitution, uh, and uh, a few weeks later I have the uh, conversation with uh, a guy named Senator Harry Reid that went like this. Uh, we're standing on the Senate floor, and Senator Reid uh, was, was nice. It was, uh, well, Jerry, how do you like being in the Senate? You like this better than the House? And Senator Reid and I knew each other from his, his locker used to be next to mine. When he was a senator, he came back and worked in the House gym. So we spent a number of mornings together. Uh, and he was just starting a casual conversation and welcoming me to the Senate. And my response was, well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity that Kansans have given me here to work on their behalf. But, sir, it doesn't seem to me like we're ever going to do anything. To which Senator Reid responded, oh, Jerry, you just need to understand, we're absolutely not going to do anything. We're certainly not going to do anything until after the next election. And I have no interest in being in the United States Senate in a place. In fact, I've never shown up for a job on day one in which the person in charge says, well, we're really here to do nothing. Um, and so the goal was to make certain we have a Senate that functions and we do something. And so we set out to get good candidates that helped us raise the money. Uh, and uh, it was, again, candidates that that had the capability of convincing voters at home that they fit those voters in their states. And again, the reminder that if you're a Republican who can get elected in Kansas, you may not be a Republican that can get elected in Washington State, Oregon. Uh, and there are differences uh, across the country. And so uh, uh, we've had the success, and I hope that you see some difference in the United States Senate. Uh, this is not just about Republicans versus Democrats. It's not just one team against another. It's also about the chance for the United States Senate to make a difference in the lives of everyday Americans and to protect and preserve our country, to meet the things that you described in your definition of, of the society, what you stand for. Uh, and if the Senate is never working, uh, we'll never have the chance to advance those causes. People complain about the partisanship of the Senate, of Congress, of Washington, D.C. Um, we're, we're, it's a partisan place. I understand that. That's, that, that's the nature of, of politics. We have people who have different points of view, but I would say that if everybody gets a fair shot at presenting their ideas, the chances are, are much greater that we reduce the partisanship. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat and you have the feel, the sense that you had the opportunity to uh, make the case for what you believe in, uh, the partisanship is diminished. There's a level of respect. It's only whenever you have a Senate that we're not going to do anything, absolutely not going to do anything until after the next election, that we uh, have this increasing animosity toward each other uh, in, the, in the goal of trying to develop policy in a very diverse country. Um, so uh, I hope that you begin to see a difference. There are still challenges that Republicans face, uh, and I still think that Senator Reid is interested in demonstrating that the only way to, that the Senate can be managed is the way that he did it, and uh, trying to find at every opportunity the chance to block uh, Republican efforts to have a legislative agenda advanced through the United States Senate. But if you look at some of the successes, and, and one of the things that I was asked as I traveled the country for two years is, so what difference would it make if there was a Republican majority? And I said, well, at least at a basic level, I think you'd see us pass a budget. Uh, every city council, every county commission, every school board in our state passes a budget every year, and we can't seem to get one done in the United States Senate. For example, we would pass a budget. And then we do 12 appropriation bills to fill the blanks. And we have passed a budget, and that's something different than before. For those of you who pay attention to particularly uh, medical issues, uh, health care, the, the doc fix, uh, this is something we've worked on for 18 years and never been able to uh, have success. It's an example of us coming together to find a solution to a problem. Uh, there's a long list of those things. The, the, the list is shorter of what we've accomplished. The list is longer of what we need to accomplish. But there is a sense that, uh, in my view, that uh, shared by Republican and Democrat senators that we can uh, actually function and, and, and move forward. I want to mention one issue that we're particularly focused on and then highlight uh, this budget issue. Let me start with that. Passing the budget is important, but the, the significance of passing the budget is actually the ability to do appropriation bills. If you ask me what my legislative agenda is, 
there's a long list of things I'm interested in and involved in, but I would say that the thing that I primarily want to focus on is forcing the United States Senate, the U.S. House of Representatives, to pass 12 appropriation bills, to have them work their way through the subcommittee on appropriations, the full committee, and onto the Senate floor. This matters significantly, not only for the normal things that people think about appropriations, priorities, how much money do we spend here, what can we spend less money on, what can we spend more money on, what can we spend no money on. That's an important thing, a, a, a primary function of, of Congress is to establish spending priorities. But the other part of this is it is the arena that gives us the opportunity to rein in the agencies and departments. Uh, we have given up the power of the purse string as a Congress. One of the reasons that Senator Reid wanted to do nothing is that if we're not doing appropriation bills, if we're doing continuing resolutions and, and uh, omnibus spending bills, the chances of us having any influence over a department head, a cabinet secretary, is greatly diminished. And only when we are how, have the power of the purse string do they start having to pay attention to us again. Part of it is it creates a dialogue, an opportunity to have uh, conversation with the cabinet secretary or an agency head and if they don't listen or are uncooperative you have the greater threat which is no money can be spent to implement this stupid idea of yours. <laughs> that's where I think that's why I think that appropriation bills are so important and whatever your issue is from the FCC to CMS uh, we have the opportunity to say I'm sorry this makes no sense to us and it has the added advantage of if we pass legislation, think of passing a piece of legislation dealing with the Endangered Species Act or with uh, clean water. If you passed, if you were capable of getting 60 votes and sending a bill to the president dealing with an environmental issue, do you believe that President Obama would sign the bill? The chances, my guess is, he would not. If it was undermining what, in his view, is the environmental agenda. But if you have a proviso and appropriation bill, this is a question that then the president would have to face. Do I veto a bill because of a proviso that deals with clean water or endangered species? And in a sense, this is a bit simplistic, but shut down one twelfth of the federal spending. Maybe the president would, but what I would argue is we have a greater chance of getting something done that's a proviso and an appropriation bill than it is a frontal assault to the president's agenda. We can, for those of you interested in financial services, where we were capable of undoing a few things in Dodd-Frank was in an appropriation bill, and the president signed the appropriation bill. So if, that's, uh, if there's a legislative agenda, hold our feet to the fire. Uh, Senator McConnell has talked about this throughout the campaign of, 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 of the last two years, about the importance of a budget and uh, appropriations. The challenge we have is four time, and as you can see, you're observing the Senate, the Democrats are eating up every minute they can and delaying tactics that make it more difficult for us to have the necessary floor time to do those deals. <coughs> and still, in my view, we ought to be hold our feet to fire, <coughs> collectively hold our, our own feet to the fire to say that appropriation bills matter, not only for the purpose of how much money we spend and where we spend it, but for the purposes of getting the attention of agencies and departments who have the, look at the commissioner of the IRS. Have you ever watched him testify? How much respect does he have for Congress? <laughs> but if we actually determine how much money the IRS gets, I was in Goodland, Kansas, and there we, in Kansas we have generally a county commission, three county commissioners. They meet and generally determine the, the funding of every office in the courthouse. Happen to have the county commissioners at my town hall meeting along with the county clerk, the register of deeds, and the, and the county treasurer. Ask the county treasurer. So if the county commission didn't determine how much money you get in your office, how much respect would attention would you pay to those three county commissioners over there? They were all polite, you know, we go to church with them in Kansas, so their, their answer wasn't exactly, their answer wasn't the truth. The truth is, we wouldn't pay any attention to them at all, but they determine whether or not I can hire somebody, or whether I gotta let somebody go in my office. And that's the, that's the circumstance that uh, constitutionally uh, and practically that Congress has to regain. The other issue I wanted to mention is veterans. I hadn't thought of this until, the, until my introduction, but one of the few examples of where Congress actually did something during uh, the days of Senator Reid, my first four years in the Senate, was something now called the Choice Act. You may recall the scandal of the VA. Uh, Phoenix was kind of the poster child and we had these fake waiting lists in which the VA was covering up long waits for veterans to get an appointment, to be seen by a physician, to be admitted to the hospital, and uh, they were pretending 
uh, something that wasn't true. We used that as an excuse to make what I think can be significant reforms in the VA. I've been a member of the Veterans Committee since I came to Congress. I'm not a veteran. I have certain, I grew up with Vietnam in the back of my life, and I have certain things I took from uh, watching the development of the Vietnam War and our soldiers, uh, men and women, returning home. And so we paid a lot of attention to veterans' issues. The VA has always been a, a, a problem. There's a, it's a huge bureaucracy with lots of challenges. In my view, over the last several years, it's become, it hasn't been managed. There's been a lackadaisical attitude that uh, there's kind of a shrug of the shoulders in a sense that we can't solve these problems and they just go on about without ever trying. So one of the things that we did was pass legislation now called the Choice Act. It has a couple of provisions. It spends $15 billion, $5 billion for the VA to hire more healthcare professionals and $10 billion to provide care outside the VA. And the law says now if you can't get the services you need from the VA within 30 days or if you live more than 40 miles from a VA facility, that the VA must provide those services at home if that's the veteran's choice. In my view, that is a good development. It reduces the workload at the VA. At the same time, we're trying to help them uh, put more professionals on staff. We remove folks from having to, to wait in those lines because they can get services at home. This is an awfully good example of, I mean, this comes from my Kansas experience. We live long, the congressional district that I represented as a House member is larger than the state of Illinois. And there is no VA hospital in the district. So, hometown services is critical for a 92-year-old World War II veteran. So, this makes a lot of sense, but what I would tell you is the VA is implementing this law in a way that does everything it can to prevent it from happening. And uh, they don't, they're not supportive of the Choice Act. They see it as a threat to keeping the dollars within the buildings. Uh, and it doesn't, they're not putting the veterans best interest at the forefront, they're putting the interest of the VA at the forefront. And I raise this issue because I would, I'm quite certain that some of you are veterans. My impression and, and thought would be that many of you know veterans, and within your companies that you represent, many of you employ veterans. There is a new opportunity for veterans, if they are aware of this, um, that they have a chance to have services at home. Uh, and you ought to help us promote this. But the the reality is they will face lots of challenges. They will call an 800 number and they will be given a bureaucratic answer. Uh, and they may be told, well, you gotta go to the VA to see if you can get admitted to the, home, to, the, to the care at home, which defeats the purpose. But an example of how the VA is uninterested in, this, in its success is first of all, this rule about 40 miles from a VA facility, they interpret it as, as the crow flies which just suggests that they're going, this doesn't matter in Kansas, we don't have lakes or, or mountains. Uh, but if you're from a state that does, it, 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 this is more of a symbolic thing. If the VA wants to go out of their way to demonstrate you don't qualify, decide that it isn't how far you have to drive, it's as the crow flies. And more is significant and more damning is the VA has decided that the 40 miles, whether or not you qualify for hometown care is determined by whether or not, quote, there's a VA facility within 40 miles of you. Well, many, not many, some communities have an outpatient clinic where routine services are provided by the VA. And in fact, in Kansas, we attended a meeting in which the VA bragged about how they were going to have a mobile van go through areas of Kansas so that the 40 miles, so that the van counted as a facility. But their current interpretation of the law is <laughs> that if there is a VA facility, a clinic, within the 40 miles, you have to drive, you don't qualify even though that VA facility doesn't provide the service that the veteran needs. And these are basic things. The veterans who call me, call us, will say, I need a shingle shot. The VA clinic 25 miles away doesn't provide shingle shots, so the VA tells me I have to drive four hours to Wichita. Um, a colonoscopy. Uh, the VA clinic doesn't provide a colonoscopy but the local hospital does, the local physician does, but the VA will say, well, there's a facility, we have a facility within 40 miles of you, uh, you don't qualify to drive. So when we talk as Republicans about smaller government, about common sense solutions, about uh, government closest to home is better, the VA is a perfect example of why the things that we believe in as Republicans, about more efficient, more hometown, more local control, uh, more common sense, less huge bureaucracies and agencies, 
the VA is an easy poster child for why we ought to make certain that we're successful in our views about limited government. We still want to take care of veterans, but we can find different and better ways than creating another bureaucracy and adding to the bureaucracy that exists at the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. Where would you like to take this conversation? Thank you.